Yeah, yeah, no, fantastic. Um, you know, for me, it just felt so great. Uh, I, 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 I went away, and uh, our son, Letha, was a part of a thing at Ron Bosch called The Journey, which is where they do this 10-day hike, and they really want the parents or the father figure especially to go and pick up their, their son and drive them back, and so we got to do that, spend some father-son time together, but I was not worried about this place at all, and that's largely because of our volunteers that make things happen, that run things, that do things here. Um, Kyle, our tech team, our guest services team, all that, you guys are amazing, and if you're not a part of an amazing team and you'd like to be, we can set you up with one, but uh, I, I walked away, I mean, I missed you, but I didn't think about you, and so, yeah, yeah, so that was, yeah, so that was good. That was very good. Um, I will say that uh, at some point I was like, man, Leafa, the church is going to be blowing my phone up telling me how much they miss me and uh, sorry I wasn't here. Get not a single message from any of you. Okay. All right. I'm not hurt by that, but you know, just the thing. Um, also, just on that note, um, I, Casey was telling me this morning, yesterday uh, was Casey and I's three-year anniversary with you guys as your pastors here at South Point Church. Uh, so yeah, it's been three years. So we have survived you for three years, you know? So, yeah, the, you guys have survived. No, we've survived you. But we're, no, we love being your pastors. It's been amazing. We can't wait for another three years, you know, to go. Love seeing what God's doing here. But um, this morning, uh, before we started our, our kind of Christmas series next week, I thought, you know, it'd be good to... Um, you know, grab a couple like one-off messages, and Kyle did a, a great job last week, and this morning uh, I've got another one for you, and, and this is called Stuck in the Middle, and um, I, I, I'm talking about, well, I'll, I'll show you here. Let, let me show you kind of some scenarios where we can feel stuck in the middle and kind of what it feels like to be stuck in the middle here. So let, let's, let's look at our first scenario here. Um, so here you could often, you know, maybe you find yourself, I love this, there's me in the middle, and then on one side it's people who don't use headphones, and then on the other side it's people who sit next to me and eat. So if you're in the middle of an airplane or a bus, and you've had someone on one side that's not using headphones, but they're listening to music on their phone, they're playing a game or Candy Crush or something, and you just hear that noise, and then next to you is somebody else who is eating, you know, next to you. I, I don't know, maybe I'm the only amazingly ang anxious person in the room, but this right here, stuck in the middle here, is not a, a comfortable place that I want to be. Um, this is why I don't fly or take buses or travel or why I have a little bit of anxiety around those things. Um, when I enter into an airplane, every single person in the middle seat, I think you are losing at life. Like something happened in your life that prevented you from getting an aisle or a, a window, and you are just not in a great place. So let's go to the next scenario here. This is one that, again, I identify with really well. Uh, the, me in the middle, and then life and responsibilities, and then growing up on the other side. Anybody can identify with that, where you're trying to... Uh, you know, span that gap between life and responsibilities and growing up on the other side. Um, and then another middle situation is this, that, that moment, it's a good facial expression here, rolling the eyes, when you're stuck in the middle of an argument um, and you can't have a side. So you're in an argument and you're not even allowed to say on this side or that side. Or even what's even better is when you get pulled into the middle of like your family's argument. Or you've got one person on one side of the family, another person on the other, and both are expecting you to be an advocate, and, you know, you hate that. So everybody here has great families that don't put you in that situation, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then kind of the last one that I have here for you, I thought this was, um, you know, really, uh, you know, kind of funny for me. But the, the sign says, clowns one way and jokers the other way, and then here I am stuck in the middle with you. Uh, growing up, I had a lot of teachers that felt this way about me, and um, they felt like they were stuck in the middle, and uh, I was either a clown or a joker on one side or the other. But the point that I'm trying to illustrate for you guys is that um, being in the middle of something, especially feeling stuck in the middle, the one I resonate the most with is the idea of being in an airplane or a bus seat and having Someone on one side that's, you know, listening to music out loud. Someone on the other side that's eating. But that, that idea of being stuck there and being in that situation, for me, is just a miserable 
idea. And, and the point that I'm trying to make to you is that the middle is not so great. Uh, oftentimes, it's not so great to be in a middle position. And I, I want to kind of tie this in with our lives because, you know, those are kind of some funny things, some situational things where you can feel like you're, you're in between a rock and a hard place, or you're stuck in the middle of a situation. But oftentimes, or a lot of the times in life, we also feel like we're stuck in the middle. And I'll, I'll, I'll expand on this and kind of explain it to you. And, and in fact, I'm going to help you find your middle this morning. I'm going to help you identify exactly where you feel stuck in the middle. And then we're going to give you some things on how to deal with that. You guys hear that? Uh, we're going to, I just like, I'm going crazy. This is it, you know. This is the end right here. Uh, I'm losing it. You hear that? Is it a bug? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> focus, Chris, focus. Uh, so, yeah, I go away for a week and it all falls apart, you know. <laughs> I fall apart emotionally now. So, I, 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 I want to kind of show you how to find your, your middle, all right? Because the, kind of the heart behind this message is, and you don't exactly know what this is yet because I haven't unpacked it, but the heart behind this message is, is this. We, we find ourselves in places. I know that you're in a place in your life. And I know that you've got situations in your life where you just feel like you're stuck. And what happens is, is we feel stuck for so long that we kind of feel like that's the end point. And what I want to show you today is that's not the end point for you, but that, that's actually the middle point, which means that there's still hope to come. There's still something to come. This is not a, a final thing for you. And so here's kind of like three or four ways that you can identify what your middle is. The first way is it always fits a pattern. And the pattern that I'm talking about is, is this. There's, there's you as you exist. Think, you know, pre, um, how you, well, I'll ex explain that in a little bit, how you feel or, or where you're at. But at some point, there is you. Life is good. It's going on. It's happy. It's fine. And then you have either a promise that was given to you so promise for a raise, promise for family, for kids. Whatever. But there's been some kind of promise given to you or some kind of expectation that you've had. Like surely by the time I'm 40, I will have X, Y, and Z done. Or surely by the time I'm 26, I will be married. But there's some kind of expectation. And then there's the end point, which is the point where you are married or you do have the job or the house is paid for, you feel like that you've arrived at something, or something that someone spoke over you feels like it's come to fruition. But then the middle is that point in the middle where you actually find yourself feeling like that thing at the end is really, really far away. And in fact, you kind of feel like you're going backwards. And so I'm going to illustrate this with, with three points. So the, the first one is, is this. You'll identify your middle by looking at what are you waiting for? So a personal example here for me. I used to uh, spend a lot of time praying for my wife and my family. And this is something that growing up, I knew that I was destined to be a husband and I was destined to be a dad. I, I knew it. I, that was a huge desire of mine. And I would think, you know, like as I got older and older and as my friends got married and they continued to get married and married and I stayed single and you know, couldn't find anybody. I just thought, like, is this ever going to happen? You know, I, I'm, I'm wondering where she is, what she's doing. I'm, I'm saying prayers for her. I'm asking God to bring her in my life. I don't know who it is, but I'm just praying for her anyway. But I was in a season of waiting. And that season of waiting kind of felt like I was stuck in the middle. God had promised me and spoken to me and said, I've created you to be a father and to be a husband. And I knew the end point was where I am now. I am a father and I am a husband. But this middle period was this period of waiting. I was waiting for God to bring my wife to me and in my life. The, the other thing that you could look at is, is what is it that you're enduring? What are you enduring in your life? I, I remember I was July 21st, 1996. I gave my life to Jesus on that same night. God called me into missions. And he told me, you're going to leave, you know, America. You're going to go to foreign land. You're going to do missions. 
And then that was the summer before my eighth grade year. And I spent all of middle school and high school and university knowing this. And I graduated and I had a job. I got recruited, had another job and another job. And I remember there was a period where, you know, I was like losing a lot of passion for the work that I was doing. But it was because I knew that God had called me to be a missionary. God had called me actually specifically to go and build the church. People would ask me, what do you want to do for a living? I would say, I want to build the church. And they'd say, oh, construction. And I'd say, no, I want to build the people. Yeah, I want, I want to build the people in the church. And that felt like it was just never going to come. And there was a long season where I was saying, God, why am I doing this job that I'm doing? Because you called me to go into missions. You called me to build the church. And yet here I am working this other job. I was enduring a season of working a job that did not align necessarily with what I felt like my calling was. And then finally, there was a point where an opportunity opened up and I was able to step into it. And that ultimately led to me being here. It led to me meeting my wife. It led to all of those things. But there was a long season of just enduring. I was enduring a job that was not what I thought God was really calling me to do. Now I'm thankful for it. I look back on it. I'm thankful for the waiting. I'm thankful for the enduring. Uh, there is nothing that is wasted about my past. But are you, what are you waiting on and what are you enduring? Those two things will point you probably to the middle season in your life. The last one I want you to look at is what is it that we're mourning? You know, we're, are, are we mourning something? Because that, that, that's a very clear middle situation. You know, for those of you that have been around here a long time, you guys know, and if, if you're new, you know, welcome. I just want you to understand, if you're new, that I'm just a regular guy with regular problems, and I talk about them a lot with you because I want you to feel comfortable with your problems. And there was a, a, a long season for me, about a three-year season, where I just battled with major uh, depression. I had three, four major depressive breakdowns in that season. And in that season... Um, I was in therapy and getting help and all of that. And, and, and as I was going through that season, there was a time where I was sitting with a, a therapist. And my therapist finally said to me one day, Chris, you've got to stop waiting for this to go away. Because it's not going to go away. This is just your life. Now, yes, I, I know that there could be miraculous healing. I'm not saying that, that I don't believe in that. I know God could just touch me and take all of it away at any moment that he wanted to. But I still, whether he was going to do that or not, I had to wrap my head around this idea that, you know what? I have to mourn the idea that this will go away one day. In order for me to move on, I have to mourn this idea that one day I won't have this in my life. You know, now I look back on that. That was absolutely a middle season for me. I'm not there anymore. That was a middle. I thought it was the end, but it wasn't. It turned out to be the middle. And so what is it that you're, what pattern in your life do you see? What are you waiting on? What are you mourning? What are you enduring? I want to encourage you to think about this, that that's your middle season right now. And you probably feel really, really stuck in this season. You can't see a way out of it. You can't see a, a, a future beyond it. You can't see how you're going to overcome the obstacles. But you will. You will overcome them. You will move out of them. And the encouragement that I want to give you, something that I've learned in going through these middle seasons and looking back on them in my life, is I, I don't want you to despise your middle season. I, I don't want you to despise this. I, I don't. You know, if you find yourself in that spot, in mourning, in waiting, in enduring, if you see that pattern in your life, that promise that's been given to you, but yet you're not there and it doesn't seem like you'll ever get there, I, I don't want you to despise that season. It doesn't mean you have to love it or enjoy it, but I don't want you to hate it. And I understand why we despise it and why we hate it. It's because as, as humans, we crave closure. And, and I, I mean, I especially crave just an enormous amount of, of closure in my life. And that, that closure means that there is an end 
to the pain. There's an end to the waiting. There's an end to the enduring. There's an end to the mourning. And so you think to yourself, if I can bring that closure faster, then that's better. If I can hurry through this season and close the door on it, then that, that's better because obviously it's better for me to not be waiting, to be enduring, to not be, uh, to not be mourning. It's so much better if I don't have that in my life. Let the thing that I've been promised that I hope for, let the, the healing that I'm hoping for, let, let the season that I want to get out of just pass as fast as possible. I want closure here. We crave that closure. But in the same way that I don't want you to despise your middle season, I also want you to understand that there is great purpose in your middle. There is an enormous purpose for you. I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. If you break up my season, uh, my life into seasons and into chunks, and I take all the significant, even the insignificant, and I just kind of place those chunks out, you know, in, in a line in front of me in life. And, and that includes like childhood, that includes memories, that includes the season where I married my beautiful wife here on the front row. Well, no, we'll exclude you from that because I want to keep you anyway. But <clears throat> if I look at all the seasons in my life, the most important, most valuable, most life-shaping, most preparative season that I have ever, ever, ever been through. The one season that I still would choose to hold on to beyond and, and above any other season in life was the hardest season that I ever went through. It was those three years of, of anxiety and depression because they did the most to draw me to God I was the most thirsty for God. It changed my personality. It humbled me. It changed everything that there was about me. It made me more sensitive. It made me understand what desperation for God is. It made me understand faith. It taught me endurance. It taught me how to wait. It taught me how to mourn, all these important things. And so I, I don't want you to despise this season. I need you to know that there's purpose in this middle season of your life. Don't Walk away or try and prematurely get out of this season that you're in. Instead, I'm going to show you how to deal with this season. How to deal with yourself while you're waiting, while you're mourning, while you're enduring. And so to do that, we're going to look at one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I love studying this guy. This guy is King David. And David's story we find in 1 Samuel. But David's story is a story of the middle it's a, he had an incredible middle season story. And I thought there is no better person that we can learn from than David. So let's look at how David handled his middle. What is it that we can learn from David? And then how we can apply it to our lives. And I, I really believe that there's some truth in here that can change your middle season. So whatever you walked into this room waiting for, uh, enduring or, or hoping for or mourning, whatever that is, all your unanswered hopes and prayers, all those things that you thought you would already have and you don't yet have, all of those things, when you walk, whatever it is you walked in here with, when you walk out of here, you're going to be especially equipped to be able to deal with that. You're going to be able to look at it in a different way. And so from my perspective, who spent a long time sitting in your chair, I was desperate and craving hope. Hope that there was meaning to what I was going through. Hope that there was significance for me. Hope that everything was going to be okay. And I'm here to tell you today that there is great hope for you. You can grab this hope, I promise. It's safe, it's real, and it applies to everyone in here. So let, let's look at the story of David here. Now, I, I can't tell you the whole story of David because it gets really, really complicated or it's really long. But I first fell in love with the story of David. I was working for a construction company and I would show up to work a little bit early and I just would have my Bible in the car and I would just sit there and, and read a little bit. I know that's such like a pastor you know, thing to say, but it, it, I wasn't a pastor at that time. Um, but I was just interested, and I started to uncover this guy, David, and I thought, this guy is so cool, man, just to read his whole story and understand his whole story. And so I've kind of just broken off chunks that are going to apply to this message here. But let, let's look at David. The, the, the first part, so there's in the middle, for there to be a middle, there's got to be a beginning. 
So let's look at David's beginning. This is when David was anointed to be king. But it doesn't play out maybe the way that we would think. Definitely, I had a hard time understanding this. I'll show you why. So when they arrived, Samuel took a look at Elab and he, well, let me explain this to you. So Samuel is going to anoint another king because there was Saul who was the king and uh, King Saul had lost favor with God. And so Samuel hears from God and God says, you're going to go and you're going to anoint another king because Saul is done and this other king's going to rise up under Saul. And so Samuel goes out and he starts looking for who's going to be that person. And if you think, um, uh, what is it, Snow White or Cin- no, Cinderella, right, with the glass slipper. So Samuel's walking around with like a glass slipper trying to see who's going to fit, whose foot fits in this shoe. So he has the shoe of kingship, and he's trying to find out who fits in that. And so he goes to Jesse's house, and Jesse had these seven sons. And, th- and these sons, David was a-, a part of this. So he goes to the house. And that's what it means of when they arrive. This is Jesse and his family. So he takes a look at Elab, which is his oldest, and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed because he's the oldest. He's the firstborn. But the Lord said to Samuel, hey, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. It doesn't mean that he was rejected from God's favor. It just means that, no, 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 it's not this guy. And so then, you know, it goes on and, Uh, God continues to explain this to Samuel. He says, The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so already in David's story, we've not even introduced David into the story here. But the truth that that I felt like jumped off this page for me is is this, is is that you are known by God. So I know that that's like a big general statement. But you're all known by God. In the same way that God sees David when he really shouldn't see David. You are known by God. You're seen by God. So we're going to see how David is chosen. And what that's going to show us is is that, that you may not feel known by your family. You may not feel known by those you work with. You may not feel significant. You may not feel like you have a great purpose. You may not feel like you can ever move out of your situation. But I need you to know that in God's eyes, you are known by God. It doesn't matter where you come from or what you're dealing with or who you are. God knows you. When He chooses you, it doesn't matter. He chooses you. We can all relax. We don't have to position ourselves when it comes to God. It's not like we're fighting for his love and for his affection. and we're, It's not like fighting for a raise at work. God just bestows that on you because he knows you. And so because God knows David, he doesn't need David to be the firstborn. Let's see. Let me show you where God finds David, where, where Samuel finds David. So Jesse then, he tells his son Abinadab, the next son, to step forward. And then Samuel says, this is not the one that the Lord has chosen. And then in verse 9, next, Jesse summons Shemiah, but Samuel said, Neither is this the one that the Lord has chosen. And then in verse 10, it says, In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all the sons that you have? And then Jesse says, Well, and this is where it's so significant that you're known by God. David was known by God. David wasn't even presented to Samuel, but it didn't matter in God's eyes. And so in verse 12, Jesse then says, he, he, he sends for uh, his son Daniel. And so it says, so, so Jesse sent, next slide, Matthew, please. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome. So, boy, I can identify with that. <laughs> and he had beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. He was known by God. He came out of the shepherd field, and he was known by God. Doesn't matter where you are, you're known by God. This is the beginning. The beginning for all of us is that we all start out known by God. And we don't have to fight or position ourselves for God's attention. We are known by God. We're chosen by God. And so the story goes on, and the Lord says, I want you to anoint him. And then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. 
And from that day on, he had the Spirit of God with him. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. Now after this, David doesn't just step into kingship. This begins David's middle season. David actually goes back out into the field, goes back out to being a shepherd. And so now while David is being a shepherd, a situation arises. Israel goes to war. David, the anointed king, is out hanging out in the fields protecting his sheep. And everyone, Israel goes to war with the Philistines. And then Goliath, most of us know the story of Goliath. Goliath, this big monster, comes out. And the two armies were kind of at a lock with each other. And the way that this worked within these two armies was when there was kind of a standoff, they would send one guy from each army would go out and they would fight each other. And the winner would then kind of be the winner of the entire battle. And that's where Israel and Philistine, the Philistines had come together is that now... Uh, the Philistines were going to send a guy out. Israel was going to send a guy out. So the Philistines send their giant, uh, Goliath, out. And he torments them for days and days and days. He just says, hey, come on, send me your best. And Saul, who's king of Israel, knows this guy's going to wipe out any of our, even our best soldiers. And so David, he hears of this. And David goes... First, he goes to take food to his brothers. And while he's there, he hears about what's going on. And David says, I cannot believe you guys are afraid of this Philistine. We are God's chosen people. Why are you guys so afraid? And then when this happens, his, his older brother, he hears what David's talking about. You know how older brothers are for their youngest brother. It's like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know. I mean, shut up and get out of here. And that's kind of what he tells him here in verse 28. And he tells him that, you know, quite, quite harshly. And he says, but when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry, he gave him a, a harsh reprimanding. What are you doing here anyway, David? See, Eliab didn't know how known David was by God. So he said, what, what is it that you're doing here, he demanded. What about those few sheep? I mean, it's like he's trying to degrade him now. Hey, go take care of your, your little flock, little brother. I don't, know, I don't understand what you're doing here. You're supposed to be taking care of them. And so then David responds in the uh, next part of the story. David actually, he was pretty determined. He even goes in front of Saul. Saul hears that there's a man who will go out and fight Goliath. And this is... David. David tells Saul, don't worry about this Philistine. David told Saul, I'll go fight him for you. And Saul says to David, like in, the, in verse 33, he says, you're not going to go fight this guy. You, you can't handle this battle. He's a warrior and you're just but a shepherd boy. So David responds. He persisted. David says, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Now I want you to Get this next couple parts here, because this is important about David's middle season. And he says, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from my flock. In verse 35, he says, I go after it with a club, and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. You know, in order to rescue a lamb from the mouth of a lion and a bear, it means that you've got to get around the mouth of a lion or a bear. That, for me, is a pretty serious, like, no-go zone. All right, I'd be like, well, that one's gone, you know, like, uh, all right, down minus one, you know, but David doesn't do that. He goes and he pulls it, rescues it from the mouth of the lion. And he doesn't say when they go into the tree to take a nap, he goes and he takes the dead lamb. No, he goes and he rescues it while it's alive from the lion and the bear. And he says, I catch it by the jaw. I catch it by the jaw and I club it to death. I mean, that is the most like hardcore thing that I can imagine. And then when he tells Saul that, he, he says, I've done this to both lions and bears and I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine. Now, now if David had despised his season of shepherding, then he would not have been ready for this moment right here. And that's why I need you to not despise your middle season. Remember, David had been promised that he would be king. And despite being promised that he would be king and being anointed by Samuel, he knew what that would have meant. Instead of stepping right into kingship, he went back out into the fields to, to shepherd his lambs. And while he's shepherding his lambs, he fights off lions and bears. 
I, I can't imagine what it would be. You know, I, I, I've been charged. We have bears in America and Tennessee. I've been charged by a bear. It's terrifying. And you have to stand your ground. You have to wave your arms. And you hope that it's a bluff charge where it veers off to the side just in, in the last moment. It's terrifying. And for, for David to chase one down and club it to death, that's a, that's a middle season. You're supposed to be king, and yet you're clubbing bears and lions in order to save the few flock and sheep that everyone else feels is insignificant. Don't despise this middle season. And, and because David did not despise his season, look at what he confidently says to Saul. In verse 37, David says, The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Guys, there is purpose found in the middle season for you. There's purpose there for you. I, I, whatever you think that your lion and your bear is, and I, I, I'm careful to, to make metaphors like that. But the, the point that I want you to take from this is David was in a hard season, stuck in the middle, with his life on the line, fighting lions and bears. And God took that hard season, and because he didn't despise it and try and get out of it, he blessed it, and there was purpose to it. Now, I want to show you one more part of David's middle season, and I'll, I'll try and get through this really quickly here. So I'm, I'm about over on time, and I really want you guys to have time to worship. But in, in verse 3 in 1 Samuel chapter 24, this is the last part of David's kind of middle season that I want to talk about with us here. And this is a situation where David had slain Goliath, and, and David was loved by people. In fact, the, there was a song that people would sing, you know, Saul has slain, you know, his, his, his hundreds. Actually, I don't remember the numbers. Hundreds? Is it hundreds? Where's Gail? Thousands, right? But David has slain his tens of thousands. You know, as King Saul, that's going to kind of rub you the hard way. It'd be like me coming in here and you guys being like, never speak again. We'll take Kyle, you know. And I would have done what Saul did. I'd throw a spear at him. But I don't know what happened to Kyle. He's not around anymore. And that's what Saul, that's what, that was Saul. Saul had already lost favor with God. He had. And so as David rises up in popularity, Saul gets this angry, evil spirit over him. And he goes after David. Because he, he wants to kill David. So David goes on the run. He goes out on the, on the lamb, which I think is funny because he was taking care of lambs. But he goes out. He goes on the run. And David finds himself at one point hiding in a cave. And that's where we find this part of David's middle story. Anointed to be king, promised a kingdom, hiding in a cave. A stinky, dirty cave that sheep used to be in. Now let's look at what happens with David here. On the way, he came to the sheepfolds where there was a cave. This is Saul. Saul has 3,000 men pursuing David. He took 3,000 people to go and conquer David. So these 3,000 people come to the sheepfolds, which was a, like a fence that, that, that shepherds would probably run their sheep into the cave and use the fence to contain them for safety. And so David's hiding in there. And Saul comes to this place. And he goes into the cave, and, and Saul went in to relieve himself. And now while Saul was doing that, and actually, the, you know, here's the question. Uh, if you think Saul was going number one, raise your hand. If you think Saul was going number two, raise your hand. There's biblical proof to this right here. The word for relieve means that his cloak was down around his ankles. His feet were covered. And so Saul is in the cave going number two. All right, some of you are like... Is this really happening here? Oh, it's happening. It's happening. So that's what Saul's doing. He, he's doing that. Now David and his men, they were sitting in the cave's innermost recesses there. And so while they're sitting, they see that Saul is in this cave. And he's definitely in a vulnerable position here. And so David's men say to him in, in verse 4, they say, Hey, behold, this is the day which the Lord has said to you. David, here it is. Middle season, over, done. Here's where you take it. You take it and you end your middle season. And so he says, Behold, I will hand over your enemy to you, and you shall do with him as it seems good to you. Then David arises in the darkness, and he stealthily walks up to Saul, and he cuts off the hem or the edge of Saul's robe. And see, here's the point for, for you here in this. And David felt this. I know he felt this. When you're in your middle season, there is temptation in the middle. 
because we want out. We want to end it. And the second something comes to light that we think could be the end of this season, the end of the waiting, the end of the mourning, the end of the enduring, we feel like this is it here. Just like David's man saying, it's over, it's done, end it. So David walks off, he cuts the corner off Saul's robe. There's temptation in your middle. Don't despise it. There's purpose. So then in verse 5, after he does this, David, his conscience starts to bother him because he had cut off the hem of Saul's robe. And he says to his men, Men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. This was wrong. I should not have done this. The Lord's anointed. God has purpose for Saul as well. God has purpose for me, David, but until God moves me into that purpose, I shall not take a shortcut. I am not going to give in to this temptation. And so he says that, that, uh, that he's forbid to do this to the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him since he is the anointed of the Lord. And then David, he actually, in verse 7, he strongly rebukes his men with these words, and he did not let them rise up against Saul. He says, guys, we're not going to take Saul. We're going to let him go. And his men got pretty upset over that. And Saul gets up, and David's opportunity to end his middle season walks out of the cave, and he goes on his way. Now, David understood this concept that we struggle with. Yes, I want you to know there's temptation that's in the middle. But something that I take away from David's decision to honor God's anointed, God's purpose for Saul and God's purpose for his life, to not take it into his own hands, is, is that in, in the middle, waiting is more important than winning. And, I, and w- what I mean by that is that, that by waiting, you're just submitting to God. Because if you really believe that you're known by God, then you've got God with you in the season that you're in. Let God move you through this season. Don't despise it. There's purpose in it. And know that God has a plan for that purpose. It's better to wait with God than it is to win by your own hand. And so out of this, we, David actually gets a huge blessing out of this. And in verse 10 here, it says, Behold, your eyes have seen today how the Lord had given you into my hand in the cave. This is David talking with Saul. And he says, some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not reach out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. And then in verse 11, look, my father indeed, see the hem of your robe in my hand. Here's proof. I didn't take this into my own hands. Since I cut off the hem of your robe and did not kill you, no one understand without question that there is no evil or treason on my hands. David is saying, I'm submitted to God. I'm waiting, I'm not winning, and that's okay. And then he he goes on, and and David says, I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait to take my life. May the Lord judge between me and you. There's David saying, I put it in God's hands. And then in in, in verse 13, uh, let's see here, Matthew, go, go on to verse 20. Let's skip ahead to verse 20. This is Saul's response to David. This is the blessing that comes to David out of this. Now behold, I know that you will certainly be king. This is what Saul tells David. The man that's trying to kill David to keep him from being king confesses. I know that one day you will certainly be king. And the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. See, God, the promises can be fulfilled through the waiting. And the thing that you feel like keeps you from ending your middle season actually may end up declaring the blessings of the end of that season. And here's the last takeaway that I want you guys to think about this morning as we head into worship. And it's that getting something out of the middle is far more important than getting yourself out of the middle. We've got to take our eyes off ourself. And we've got to look at what's happening here. What purpose is in this season for me? And in fact, I know that the middle is not so great, but the God standing with you in your middle is great. And so as we head into worship here, what I want you to do is please, please look at the pattern in your life. Find your middle season. What are you waiting for? What are you enduring? 
What are you mourning? Don't despise that season. There's purpose in that season. Don't give in to the temptation to get yourself out of that season. It's far better to wait with God than to win at your own hand. Now, when we pray here, after we pray, I just want you guys to know that at the back of the room, especially, I know we've got a few new people here this morning. On one side, we have a communion station. You can walk up and take communion, um, and there'll be somebody there to help you with that. And in the back on the other side, we've got these candles for you to light. It just brings an action to kind of signify the prayer that you're praying. If you have a prayer, a need or something, it, it, it's so great to tie that in with some kind of action. And, that, and that's what the candle lighting is in the back there. And then we've got our prayer partners in the back. If you need prayer for anything at all, doesn't matter what it is, we're praying church, we believe that God answers prayers, then you can go back and get prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the middle seasons that we're all in. And I pray that everybody in here has brought to mind their middle season. And I pray that every single person in here, by the authority and the name of Jesus, will put aside how they may be despising that middle season. And instead, they would look for your purpose. So Lord, do a whole bunch of revealing. Reveal that purpose to everybody as we pray and then as we sing and we worship you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. You guys can stand as we worship. So I want to share a scripture with us uh, before we sing. And that scripture comes out of Romans 8 verses 35. It says so.